Well, this is awkward. Probably not the video you were expecting, but after 500 hours on record, an online platform handed to me out of nowhere, and a built-up community of eccentric meme lords, this seems like the perfect time to give the more serious, analytical thing a try. Again. For me, Blaze Blue Central Fiction was an impulse buy, and definitely one of the best ones I've ever made. I remember back when the rollback beta was first put into the game, my thoughts were something like, you know, I'm happy for them, but I think I'd rather stick with Strive for now. That was until I was sitting in a call with my friend Josh, and they were all, I have purchased Blaze Blue Central Fiction, and I was like, this motherfucker. So we played some matches, I recorded them, and you know the rest. After playing hundreds of video games across my life, my attention span has degraded to the point where I don't stick to the same game for longer than a month or two, even if I really like it. This one is an exception. Even during the period where Elden Ring released and I didn't play it all for an entire month or two, I still came back to it eventually. So what's the draw? Let's talk about it. I've only recently gotten dragged into the anime fighter hole, so I'm still a bit out of my element here. As you would expect, it's incredibly vibrant and colorful, but it manages this while still being one of the most readable fighting games I've ever played. Guilty Gear Strive has similar visuals to Central Fiction, but I had some issues with its implementation. All of the models and environments are very meticulously detailed, but they blend together and frequently get obscured by attacks and effects, so I would occasionally lose track of what was happening while playing. I don't have this issue nearly as much with central fiction because while the stages are 3D environments, the characters are 2D sprites, which makes them pop out a lot more. I could see an argument being made for this looking like garbage, but I think the gameplay importance dwarfs the aesthetic appeal here. As for the actual art style... Okay, so I need to play a clip from Mandalore Gaming really quick, just to somewhat inform you about my taste for stuff like this. I don't hate anime. I hate this. I don't get it. I don't understand people enjoying this, like, Jesus Christ. You gotta understand where I come from. My aesthetic bread and butter is stuff like Dead Space, Fear, Stalker, Dark Souls, anything that's really grimdark or a complete splatterfest will be up my alley. Anime fighters, and this one in particular, are an adjustment to say the least. There's a lot of character designs that I really hate, but there's enough that I enjoy that it's not really a problem for me. They all look and sound very distinct, even taking custom colors into consideration, which makes overcoming the game's biggest skill curve, learning matchups, that much easier. Sometimes characters do have a similar look to each other, but differ heavily in gameplay. The animations for the characters are wonderful. Combined with their voice and sound design, they inform a lot about a character's personality without even needing to touch the story mode. And that's not even taking into consideration the relationships characters have with each other. Even viewing this scene with no context and not being able to understand a word of what is being said, you can still feel the history between these two. The stages are also very nice to look at. There's a ton of variety between them all. This one has an entire day-night cycle. It's such a cool detail that I didn't notice until I had 300 hours of playtime. The visuals are completely on point, and this extends to the sound as well. <laughs> Blaze Blue Soundtrack Good! Everyone and their mother can tell you that Blaze Blue's got a good soundtrack, but I've yet to see anyone actually explain why beyond it just bangs, so here goes. The soundtrack has a consistent rocky theme, but there's enough variation on a track-to-track -track basis that pretty much every song is memorable. You've got tracks like Dissonance, which are just all-out jam sessions. But then there's weirder stuff, like Awakening the Chaos, which throws an opera singer into the mix. This variance isn't done thoughtlessly, either. Songs can fit their associated characters extremely well. Let's talk about Naoto for a second. This character is very fast, does huge damage, and has a higher density of button presses compared to other characters. Naoto's theme fits this lightning-fast playstyle perfectly. It's a shrieking, blood-boiling shred that hits almost as hard as he does.
Now let's talk about Kagura. Like Naoto, he does bonkers damage, but he's much slower and heavier about it, probably on account of the giant sword that he uses as a surfboard. And suitably, his theme is much slower and heavier to match. Even beyond the gameplay, the music can also be very expressive of a character's role in the story. Susanoo is a god of destruction bent on wiping out the entire universe. His theme is a mix of dark, pounding beats and unintelligible Japanese doomsaying. <laughs> For being largely a genre of music I don't really care for, Blaze Blue's soundtrack is incredibly memorable and never really boring, but it's not the only enjoyable part of this game's sound design. The voice acting and the sound effects themselves also deserve mention. The sound work for attacks is stylish and impactful. Me hit man with sword, me get dopamine chemical. Characters and attacks sound basically exactly how they look. Here's some moves that are dark and demonic. Here's some moves that are more bright and sparkly. And here's some moves that are more raw and kinetic. Most sound effects are shared between all characters, but there's still a huge amount of completely unique sound palettes that gives each character that much more identity. Speaking of which... The voice acting is incredible. Now, it is kind of hard for me to judge because it's all in Japanese with no subtitles or dub and I don't speak the language, but disregarding that, there's a massive amount of distinction and dramatic weight lent to each character through performance alone. <laughs> ほうほう。こいつはまた不思議な。てめえ、男かよ。そういう趣味はごめんだよ。a character's voice lines may even change depending on who they're fighting. I could bang on about this for a while, but the point is, they just understood the assignment, dude. All of these things in a vacuum work perfectly fine, but when it all comes together, it borders on transcendent. Oh yeah, the fighting. Pushing my silly little buttons and shit. Blaze Blue's a fighting game, so here's how to fight. There's four attack buttons, light, medium, heavy, and drive. String them together in ascending order and mix in some special moves to form combos. There's a lot you gotta consider when making a combo. Are they far away? Are they close? Are they crouching? Are they in mid-air? Are you in mid-air? Are they in the corner? Are you in the corner? Do you have overdrive? Do you have meter? Do they have burst? Did you counter them? Did you fatal counter them? Did you kill Caligula for the pipe bomb recipe? It is a lot to take in, and mistakes are inevitable. And all of this is just for comboing, the easiest part. I can't tell you how many people I've seen express their urge to play this, but feel overwhelmed at everything going on and burn out fast. You can't reasonably expect yourself to absorb this much information after after only playing for a few hours. If you are one of these people, my advice is stop holding yourself to such a high standard and take things one step at a time. Blaze Blue has some subtle visual and audio tells to inform you about how certain mechanics work. If you get hit by a high attack when you're blocking low or vice versa, an exclamation mark will flash on screen to let you know you were blocking in the wrong direction. Grab attacks, which are typically unblockable, always use the same sound effect, making them easier to identify. If you hit your opponent while they have iframes, it'll produce a unique hit spark. Same for 
blocking and armored attacks, further reducing ambiguity. I'm not the type of person to play tutorials. I learn best by just experiencing things, so having all these subtle effects does wonders to make learning the game easier while playing it and not having to lab as much. However, I don't think you can get away without labbing anything at all. The characters are all wildly different from each other to the point where picking an unfamiliar one feels like playing a completely different game. Even what I said earlier about attack buttons isn't universally true. Some characters can't rapid fire their attacks as freely, some of them can go fucking backwards. The only way to know for sure is to play them a bit. Some do share similarities, but regardless, they all have utterly cracked skill ceilings and weird specific tech that makes investing hundreds of hours into any of them extremely rewarding. This is true for every character in the game, even ones with low skill floors or are otherwise considered basic, and the fact that there's 36 of them is fucking concerning. I never get tired of watching random footage of characters I play and seeing something weird and going, wait, you can do that? And then opening up training mode to try and replicate it. Going in depth on individual characters' mechanics would drive me further into the abyss and balloon this video's runtime to ungodly lengths. Instead, I'll just broadly speak on what I enjoy about central fiction over other fighting games. Item number one. <laughs> Supers. Here's a super from another fighting game. Let's do this. Taste Now here's a similar super from BlazBlue. I have problems with supers in other fighting games. One is that most of them are way too long for something that could be happening multiple times around. And two is that they fuck with the camera too much. It takes me out of the flow of the fight. Central fiction supers by comparison are usually quite brief and hardly move the camera at all. They don't feel like nearly as much of a pace breaker as they are in other games. Item number two. Mechanics. Ah yes, this must be some of that deep nuanced player expression I hear so much about. Fighting games at their core are constantly making you balance risk versus reward. Central Fiction just does it better than any other game I've tried. Taking universal and character-specific mechanics into account, your options for a given situation are incredibly powerful, but misusing them will get you cooked. Let's talk about the defensive options. Whenever you get knocked down, you can tech roll in various directions similar to a Smash Bros game. Teching in place offers the most invincibility, but also takes the longest, giving your opponent plenty of time to run their Oki on you. Teching back Backwards has less invincibility but makes distance, which can be better or worse for you depending on the matchup. If you're already in the corner though, it's basically useless. Teching forward has almost no invincibility at all, but if you're close enough you'll roll through them. This can get you out of the corner or other bad screen positions, but because the move has such low invul and if the opponent sees it coming, they'll catch you and start comboing you again. And finally, you can do a quick getup, which has no invincibility at all but lets you act much sooner, so if your opponent is expecting one of the other options, you can mash fast buttons and smoke them. If you're blocking attacks, you can spend 50 meter to do a counter assault, an invincible get off me attack. If it works, it'll blow your opponent across the screen, but it's slow and can be baited and punished in various ways. Most ASW fighters have a burst, another invincible fuck off move. This one is for when you're already getting comboed, but it has a very long cooldown. You rarely get more than two of them. And on top of that, it can be baited and punished like everything else, albeit with much more difficulty. Nowhere is the risk reward dynamic exemplified better than right here. This is Overdrive, the most badass shit in the whole video game. If you press the burst button whilst not getting hit, instead of bursting, you'll enter this powered up state. The effects it gives you varies from character to character, but generally, all of your highest damage is accessed from this mode. You can cancel into it the same way you would a special move, but most importantly, you can cancel into it while blocking. The activation is completely invincible, so if your opponent does a high recovery move while pressuring you, you can iframe through it and slam them. You're incentivized to use this like a comeback mechanic. It lasts longer the lower your health is, from 4 to 8 seconds, cut in half if you cancelled into it. Learning how to properly use Overdrive isn't easy, but the game-changing power and versatility it provides makes it worth it. And this is all just the universal stuff that everyone can do. The moment you start getting into character-specific mechanics is the moment it's already too late for you. Item number three. <laughs> 
DLC. If you're really waist deep in this genre, you get home from work and you gotta agonize over which of the four or five games you want to grind, I have a question for you. How much money have you spent on DLC characters? Let me append that. How much money have you spent buying DLC characters as they are released and not in bulk? Probably, like, way too fucking much, right? And like, look, I get it. Expecting this content to be free after I already paid 60 fucking dollars for the full game is unreasonable, apparently. But when the cost of all this shit added up is greater than the fucking game itself twice over, it's hard not to look ridiculous. Fuck your lame-ass, tired-ass, fighting game difficulty discourse. I want to know how many new players were looking to get into one of these games and were turned off before they even got in a match because half the fucking roster is grayed out. Type Lumina is one of the only games to get this shit right, just stay at full price and release it for free. On a purely monetary basis, that game has only been getting more worth playing over time. But this video isn't about Melty Blood. Central Fiction's DLC consists of one funny old cat man that, like, five people care about. Maybe. He is still pretty grossly overpriced. I'd say wait for a sale if you're interested. I got him when he was a dollar. The thing is, he's the only DLC. Everything else, all 35 other characters, characters, unique announcers, unique colors, and other cosmetics all come bundled with the game as is. Some of them you need to earn through the in-game currency, but on a value for money basis, Central Fiction is excellent. Now, I know some of the more terminal Blaze Blue heads among you are probably saying, please talk about the story. To you, all I have to say is, please go outside. Feel the warmth of the sun, feel the wind on your skin. It's beautiful out there. While you're having your joyous frolic, you'll come to the realization that Arc System Works story modes were not meant to be comprehended by us mere mortals. You'll find no relevant or meaningful discussion of Blaze Blue's story here. There are other channels for that. As for me, I don't give a shit. I've heard good things, but it's not what I play the game for. Let's wrap this up. Blaze Blue Central Fiction is a stylish, intoxicatingly fun fighting game well worth spending hundreds of hours getting good at. More worth the time than whatever the current live service hamster wheel is, anyway. There's a huge amount of variety to everything. A massive cast of characters, all with dizzying skill ceilings and numerous color alts, tons of stages, a huge memorable soundtrack, all manner of collectibles, strong single-player content with story mode and Grim of Abyss, and almost none of it is DLC exclusive. It's one of the most content-rich games I've ever played. I don't regret my my time with it even slightly. Even after hundreds of hours, it's still a rush like nothing else. That's it. This video was a long time coming. I forgot how difficult these reviews were to produce. I'm not sure if they're gonna become a regular thing again. It might be disappointing to hear, but I don't think it's gonna happen unless this video pops off astronomical style. For those of you that enjoy and prefer these types of videos from me, all I'll say is, I have not forgotten about Blasphemous 2.